OK, so we're going to look at continuous functions. We're going to see a really cool example of a function which is continuous only at a single point, and it's discontinuous everywhere else. So before we get to that, we'll build up some intuition about what exactly is a continuous function. So the most simple way of understanding a continuous function at an intuitive level would be for something like if your function is x squared, you could draw the graph of your function without lifting your pen off the page or off the board. So for x squared, you can see we can just draw this without having to lift the pen off the board there. Whereas if you have a function which isn't continuous everywhere, then the only way of drawing this is you need to lift your pen up at some stage. So for a function, a graph of y equals 1 over x, you can draw most of it. You can draw this negative part here where x and y are negative. But then at some point, you need to draw the positive contribution as well. And these two aren't connected to each other. So this is the most straightforward intuition behind what a continuous function is. You can see at this discontinuity when x is 0, it's not connected in terms of the graph. But then we can also get a function which is discontinuous everywhere. So here's a nice example of one. We could define our function to be equal to 1 when x is a rational number that can be expressed as a fraction, or it's 0 if it's not a rational number. So it would be 0 at pi or at root 2, root 3, for example. And if we were to try and draw a graph of this function, it's not really possible to draw, but we can get an idea for what this looks like. There's loads of points where your function is equal to 1, all of the rational numbers, but then interspersed between the rational numbers, there are lots of irrational numbers. So you'd also have loads of points down at 0 like this. You can see there's no way of drawing this without having to move your pen about lots. Even drawing this bit at the top isn't connected to each other. So this function isn't continuous everywhere. So what about this idea then of having a function which is continuous at a single point, but not continuous anywhere else? Well, this intuition of being able to draw a function without lifting your pen up doesn't really make any sense then if it's continuous at a single point, because even for this one, which is continuous nowhere, you can draw the function at a single point without having to lift your pen up, I suppose. So we need to have a more rigorous, more formal definition of what actually is a continuous function if we want to test this. So if we go for looking back at our continuous example, instead of focusing on the fact that we can draw a graph of this function without having to lift the pen up, we'll think of this intuitively as more like saying, if we zoom in on our graph, let's imagine we have a certain point here, our input x, and then we make a very small change to our input. We should only see quite a small change to our output, the difference between f of x and f of a different value of x there. And you can see this works for our graph of y equals x squared. You move along a tiny bit, you're only going to get a tiny change in the output, because this is all joined together. Whereas for 1 over x, we've got these two separate pieces. So here, if we were to take a negative value of x really close to 0, we can compare this with a positive value of x really close to 0. The difference between the x values is only very small, but the difference between the output, between the f of x values, would actually be really big there, because the graph isn't connected there. And similarly, where we've got this function that's 1 when we have a rational number, or 0 otherwise, you can see there's loads of points. We could take two points right next to each other, where there's just a really, really tiny difference between them and the difference in the output would be really big. It would be 1 compared to, you can have a, as small a difference as you like between these x values, and you could still get a difference of 1. So we'll make this idea of continuity more rigorous, more formal now, and then we'll build on this to construct an example of a function which is only continuous at a single point. So here we've written the formal definition of what it means for a function f to be continuous at a point x0, and we'll draw a picture to accompany this. So if you imagine this is part of the graph of our function f, and we'll say this point here is where x is x0, so this definition is telling us that we want to make this more formal, the idea of small changes in your input correspond to small changes in our output. So if we want to measure a small change in our output, we do this by saying for all epsilon greater than 0, so this is for any however small your epsilon you choose, we're always going to be able to do this. So, And then this is going to be measuring the difference between our output f of x0 and an output f of x in a nearby point. 
So then for any value of epsilon that we choose greater than zero, we're always going to be able to choose a value of delta so that we could perhaps choose delta so that it's these two points here. So then you'd have this would be x naught plus delta here. This would be x naught minus delta here. So then any input in between these values would lead to an output, which is within epsilon of our original output f of x naught. So this is just intuitively what our picture looks like for a continuous function with this more formal definition. And you can see how this works with a discontinuous function as well. So if we return to our example that was always equal to 1 whenever you had a rational input and it was always 0 when you had an irrational input, we could pick our value of x0, let's say up here it's a rational number. Well, let's choose a value of epsilon, and we need to be able to do this for all epsilon greater than zero, even really, really small values. Can we choose a value of delta so that any value of x, any input near here, would give an output which is also nearby within this region here, epsilon above and below one? Well, this isn't going to be possible because actually the rational numbers and the irrational numbers you can get as close as you like to each other. So there'll always be an irrational number close to this value x0 here, where the difference between f of x0 and f of x, so we can just call this one x, so here your absolute value, your difference between f of x0 and f of x would actually always be equal to 1, which would be greater than our value of epsilon that we've chosen there. So now how do we expand on this to make a function that's actually going to be continuous at exactly one point? Well, we can take this idea of having a function which is nowhere continuous and change this picture so that it's going to be continuous just at one point. So we could take a function which is going to be, let's say it's going to be zero still when we have an irrational input, but instead of it being equal to one when we get a rational input, we could say it's equal to x. So we'll get a picture like this where it looks like the graph of y equals x for rational inputs and it looks like the graph of y equals zero for irrational inputs. So writing this more formally you can define your function f of x to be equal to x when x is a rational number and it's zero when x is not a rational number. So you can see here this should be continuous actually at the point zero because all of your outputs are going to be very, very close to zero in this small neighbourhood. Whereas if you choose any other point, whether it's on this line y equals x or it's elsewhere on the line y equals zero, if you choose a point, let's say here, then you want to choose a small enough value of epsilon, but there'll be some values of x which are really close to that input where the output would actually be x away from that, so this wouldn't always work. So we'll make this a bit more rigorous, but just to show intuitively where this function comes from, we can now get an intuition for why this function perhaps ought to be continuous only at a single point. So now let's verify that the function is actually continuous at zero, then later we'll check that it's not continuous anywhere else. So at zero we get the input zero is the same as the output zero, as zero is a rational number following our definition there. So f of zero is zero, and now following our definition we want to say that for all values of epsilon we can find a suitable value of delta so that this inequality holds. So if we now say we've, imagine we have some arbitrarily small value of epsilon greater than zero, what we want now is to find a suitable value of delta so that the difference between f of zero and f of x in this interval is always less than epsilon. So this is particularly nice for this function because it's quite simple. So f of zero is just equal to zero. So the modulus of this is just the modulus of negative f of x, or that's the same as the modulus of f of x. So we can rewrite this and say, i.e., this is the same as saying we want the modulus of f of x to be less than epsilon. And now this is quite easy to achieve because first of all, f of x is zero on any irrational input. So that's going to be satisfied that the modulus is less than epsilon automatically for any irrational input. And for a rational input, the modulus of f of x is just going to be the modulus of x. So we could actually choose our interval to be, let's say we have x, which is between negative epsilon and positive epsilon. Then you can see that the modulus of f of x is either going to be zero or it's going to be the modulus of x. So this is, in this interval, going to be 
less than epsilon for all values in this interval. So this is saying actually for all values of epsilon greater than zero, we can choose delta equal to epsilon and then our definition is satisfied. For all values of x in this interval, plus or minus epsilon away from zero, the modulus of f of x, zero minus f of x, is indeed going to be less than epsilon. So the function is continuous at zero. And to see why our function isn't continuous anywhere else, we'll return to a picture of the graph of this function. So we've got the line y equals zero, so we get an output of zero whenever we put an irrational input in. Then we also have the line y equals x, so we get an output of x whenever we put a rational input in. So now we want to say that this function isn't continuous. So let's say we have a value of x which isn't zero. We'll start with a positive value and then it'll be very similar to show that our function isn't continuous at a negative value. So we could draw x, let's imagine x is here. So whether x is rational or irrational, you'd have y equals x and you've also got y equals zero down here. It's just a matter of choosing a value of epsilon now so that we can draw a neighborhood around this. So whether our x is the irrational value down here or if it's the rational value up here, we want to be able to draw a value of epsilon so that in these regions, the function is still taking values outside of this little epsilon neighborhood. So here we could actually just take, for each of these small distances going from our function down, we could take x over three for each of these distances, because this total distance going from zero all the way up to x is just x, so there's definitely no overlap there. So here we could take epsilon greater than zero could be x over 3. So if we have epsilon is x over 3, which is indeed positive, then we're not going to be able to choose any value of delta so that we can say all of our outputs are within epsilon of the original output, because we'll, let's imagine we had the rational one was our input, and we'd always have irrational numbers arbitrarily close to that so that we would have an output of 0, which is outside of this interval being within epsilon of f of x. So this all relies on the fact that rational numbers and irrational numbers are indeed arbitrarily close to each other. So this isn't something we'll prove, but this could be an interesting topic for a future video. So we've seen then that this function is indeed continuous at a single point and it's discontinuous everywhere else. But we can actually come up with examples which are going to be continuous at two points or at three points or at whichever number of points you like. So a nice way of doing this could be you could take a quadratic function and intersect this with the line y equals zero, for example. And we could write this more formally as f of x is equal to, let's say it's x minus one times x minus two whenever x is rational, and we'll say it's zero otherwise when x isn't rational. So here we would get this intersection at one and at two. So just following our previous kind of argument, you could see how this function should be continuous at exactly two points and discontinuous everywhere else. And we could do the same sort of thing. We could say f of x if you want to have n different points where our function is continuous and for it to be discontinuous everywhere else. We could write this as the product x minus one times x minus two all the way along to x minus n, which would give us n roots where this intersects at zero, so we'd have n points where the function is continuous following a similar argument to before, and it would be discontinuous everywhere else. And we could actually also achieve infinitely many points, and we could do this perhaps with, let's say, a sine type function. So if we have, let's say our function is equal to sine of x when we have a rational input, and we'll say it's equal to zero when we have an irrational input, we get infinitely many intersections at zero here, and you can see at each of those intersections, following our previous argument, you would get a continuous function at that point, but it would be discontinuous everywhere else.